Presentation of Science Trek on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Trees provide us oxygen, shade, and beauty, but they do more. Trees give animal shelter, reduce air pollution, and prevent erosion. Want to find out more about trees? We're here to answer your questions. Stay tuned. Science Trek is next. Hi, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen, and welcome to Science Trek. And welcome to the Laura Moore Cunningham Memorial Arboretum. An arboretum is a place where they grow trees for people to study. You know, kind of like an outdoor museum. The trees here will also be replanted in parks and along city streets. We're here to answer your questions about trees. But before we do, let's learn a little bit more. What is the oldest thing on earth? What's the heaviest? What's the tallest? It's a tree! A tree is a plant. It's a special kind of plant because it builds up strength by producing wood. Trees have five basic parts. The roots, the trunk, the branches, the leaves, and the flowers or seeds. Roots are what trees use to collect water and nutrients. They also spread out to keep the tree standing upright. Roots from a 150 foot tall tree stretch under the earth for the area the size of a soccer field. The trunk is the tree's support and transport system. The center part of the trunk is called the heartwood, the supporting pillar of the tree. It's made up of dead cells. The next layer is the sapwood. It contains a system of tubes like straws. It transports water and nutrients from the roots through to the leaves and the other parts of the tree. The next layer is the cambium. It makes new sapwood and new bark each year, allowing the tree to grow wider. The outside layer is the tree's bark. The outer bark protects and insulates the tree. The inner bark or phylum carries sap full of sugar from leaves to the rest of the tree. Bark varies a lot from type of tree to type of tree. Some of it is so unique that you can identify the tree just by looking at the bark. You can tell how old a tree is by looking at its trunk. Every year a tree grows, it adds a new growth ring. Count the rings and you know how old the tree is. The way a tree spreads its branches depends upon its species. Trees reach out to expose their leaves to the sun. Together the branches and the leaves or needles make up the tree's canopy. And like you, trees need food. <laughs> Except that trees make their own food. They use a process called photosynthesis. Water and nutrients are sent up from the roots to the leaves. The leaves take in carbon dioxide from the air. Using energy from the sun, the leaves combine the water and the carbon dioxide to make sugars that the tree uses to feed itself. And in the process, the leaves release oxygen and water vapor into the air. Trees also produce seeds. Many trees produce a flower that's pollinated and grows seed, but some trees produce the fruit we eat, like apples and pears. Their seeds are protected inside their fruit. A pine cone is a kind of fruit. It contains a pine tree's seeds. The seeds are dispersed by the wind or other animals, take root on the ground, and start growing a new tree. There are two basic kinds of trees, broadleaf and conifer. Broadleaf, or sometimes called deciduous trees, have leaves that bud out in the spring and grow full and lush in the summer. Then the leaves turn color in the autumn and drop to the ground. Almost all conifer trees have dark green needles that stay on year-round. Conifer trees basically have two kinds of needles. Some have short needles that look and kind of feel like combs, and others have long needles that come in bundles. And one kind of conifer tree does change color in the fall. Tamaracks turn a beautiful yellow and then go back to green in the spring. Trees play an important part in the environment and in our lives. They shade our homes, protect our soil, and give animals and people a place to live. We get paper, lumber, medicine, fruit, nuts, even maple syrup from trees. And environmental causes like air pollution, 
climate change, deforestation, and overcrowding can harm trees and forests. Trees are very good at adapting to the land around them. They can outlive all other living things. But we humans need to make sure we protect the air, water, and soil so trees can grow. And we need to plant trees and take care of our forests to improve the environment. Trees are essential to all of us. And joining me now to answer your questions about trees are two guests. Michelle Youngquist is the educational coordinator from the Idaho Forest Products Commission, and Brian Jorgensen is the Boise City Forester. Thank you both for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go to your questions. Hi, I'm Brock, and I go to Owyhee Elementary. And my question is, how come tree bark is hard? Well, if you think about the purpose of tree bark, it's to help protect all of the parts that are growing inside of that tree trunk. And if you think about the types of things it might be protecting it from, a lot of things it would be helped to be hard. So I think that's why tree bark is hard. It helps protect from animals or lawnmowers running into them. It helps protect from sunlight that might be beating on the tree or really hard wind or sand being blown into them. Lots of different things can harm a tree. Still some things can get through, like some insects can drill through hard bark, but the hard bark really helps protect the tree, at least from those kinds of minor attacks. James asks, how deep do tree roots go? How deep do tree roots grow? That's a really good question, and a lot of people uh, still don't know the answer to that question. Um, for a long time, when I was in school, they always pulled down a poster of the, of the tree, and they showed the top of the tree with the branches going way up into the air, and then, and then they showed the underground part, and it looked just like a mirror image of the, uh, of the upper part with a big, long stem that they called a tap root with a bunch of branches going way deep into the soil. Uh, now we know uh, more clearly that uh, tree roots, most of the tree roots, about 90% or more, are in about the top two feet of soil. And they're not just right under the tree. Tree roots grow just like, uh, in a way, uh, the, the top of the tree. They branch and go different directions, and, and some are deeper and some are more shallow. Uh, but they grow out well beyond the outer reaches of the canopy itself. So uh, you, know, you could have a tree that has a canopy that's 30 feet wide from edge to edge, um, but the roots may go out 50 feet. Now, roots next to the tree trunk are large and they ac actually help support the, uh, the tree in the ground and, and make it strong in the ground. As the, branch, or as the roots continue to grow out into the soil, they get narrower and narrower and, and most of the roots that take up water are real close to the surface uh, of, the, of the soil so that when it rains they can capture that water real quickly. Uh, they're also very small, smaller than a, than a hair on your head, and they're, they're, there's, a, there's many, many, many of them, too many to count. Uh, roots are vital to the survival and health of a tree, and it's important that you take care of the roots as much as it is that you take care of the tops of the tree. Abby Erica asks, how does a tree grow? Trees grow from a start of a tiny little seed, and if that seed needs to land in a spot that's favorable for that tree to, to be able to sprout, for that seed to be able to sprout. And um, that might be a spot with um, bare soil that's showing, and they get the right amount of sunlight and water, and things are just right so that that seed sprouts. And then the little, little tiny seedling will put roots down into the soil, and it will start to grow its first trunk and branches and really just initial needles at first. So when you look out in the forest or even in your yard, you'll find little, little tiny trees that are just getting started from seeds that fell in a good spot. Then after that, they're really working on collecting water and nutrients from the soil. They do that through their roots and then being able to have enough leaves or needles to collect sunlight so that they can do photosynthesis and make more food for themselves. And as they do, then they're able to um, make shoots that go up and make them taller and then also they're able to add on layers of wood every year and make an annual ring. And so they grow up and out every year as long as the conditions are right for them to grow. They need food which they make themselves by um, sanding in the sunlight, they need carbon dioxide, they need water and nutrients. As long as they've got those things and not too harsh of conditions, they'll usually be able to grow. 
Hi, I'm Alex and I go to Waikiki Harbor School and my question is, why do tree branches grow in different directions instead of just straight up like the trunk? Uh, tree trunks, tree branches grow in a lot of different directions. I would say just because they, um, trees like to orient their leaves in a lot of different directions in order to gather sunlight uh, because the leaves are the factories that produce the food for the trees. So if tree branches all went straight up, they would uh, only be in a position in uh, at kind of one time of the day uh, to make use of that sunlight that they soak up for food. So um, there are some trees that have different orientation of branches, some of them that grow more straight up than others, while others kind of grow all over the place in very irregular growth pattern. Um, I think it's one of the things that I appreciate about trees the most is they all do look different than they're all each individual little pieces of art in themselves. Some trees can sort of talk to each other. When willows are attacked by insects, they emit a chemical that alerts nearby willows of the danger. The neighboring trees then respond by pumping more tannin into their leaves, making it harder for invading insects to survive. Olivia asks, why are there deciduous trees and non-deciduous trees? Well, I think it has to do with the huge variety of environments where trees grow. So they've got lots of different conditions to cope with, and if they happen to be growing in a very cold area where the growing season is short, it might be advantageous to them to be a conifer tree where they've got needles for their leaves that they keep year after year and maybe only lose a few of those needles every year instead of all of them at once. And when they lose all of them at once, that's called a deciduous tree. And most of the times we talk about deciduous, like those trees that we're familiar with that turn colors in the fall. They lose all their leaves every fall and then they grow new ones in the spring. Most of our evergreen trees are the ones that we, we refer to our conifers that way. Conifers um, have the needles for leaves, but we do have one special tree in Idaho that is a deciduous conifer. And so we have one tree, it's the western larch. Sometimes people call it a tamarack. And it will turn yellow, bright yellow, every fall. All the needles will fall off and then it will regrow new needles in the next, in the next growing season. So in the spring it will, it will make all new needles. So it, um, I think, has to do with where the trees are growing, the different varieties of habitats that they might have to contend with, and different adaptations that different trees have. Hi, I'm Amanda and I go to Owyhee Harbor Elementary School and my question is why do leaves on some trees change colors? Uh, that's such a big question Amanda. Uh, why do trees, tree leaves change color? Um, some of the tree colors, uh, for instance on some of the yellow colors you see in the background behind me, uh, are actually there in the tree all year long. Um, they, there's just so much uh, chlorophyll, the green chlorophyll in leaves, that uh, it masks that yellow color. So in the fall, when the days get shorter and the nights get chillier, the tree gets kind of a signal that says um, it's time to get ready for winter. So it starts to dismantle all of its chlorophyll, and when the chlorophyll goes away, the yellow color is left remaining there. Um, the red colors, on the other hand, that you see behind me are, um, are actually a product of, of sunlight. It's also a product of um, the tree kind of getting ready for uh, winter. Sometimes some of the sugars that the leaves produced are left behind in the sugar. And uh, uh, similar to when you uh, cook uh, sugar water on the stove, it can actually kind of boil down and turn into this kind of brownish reddish uh, caramel colored stuff. It's, it's kind of similar to that. It's the same reason that apples are red on one side and, and green on the other. The red side was exposed more to the sunlight um, at some point and all of the uh, sugars in that part of the apple colored to red. Um, so, and there's colors in between there too. They all have uh, all sorts of scientific names, but I'll spare you that at this point. Hi, my name is Ike, and I go to Cynthia Mann Elementary School. And my question is, what is the tallest tree in the world? Last that I heard about it, it was a redwood tree in California, and people have nicknamed it Hyperion. 
and last I saw it was 379 feet tall. So that's a really, really tall tree. Just envision a 10 foot space. That's kind of something that people can imagine and then stack 37 or 38 of those on top of each other. That's a really tall tree. At the University of Idaho's Parma Research Station, they grow 162 gene types of stone fruit, things like peaches and apples, as well as grapes and alternative fruits. Esi Falahi is the station's director and professor of palmology, the science of fruit crop physiology. What we are doing here, we are trying to uh, have better fruit, higher quality, better looking fruit, and definitely safe food that we can present to our growers and they can grow that for the public. Here researchers test different varieties of stone fruit under different conditions to see what works best. We are looking for better size and uh, more resistant to cold. And also we are looking for flavor, color. So yield alone is not enough. We have to look at a number of other factors. This is an example of different varieties of peaches that we have. For example, this peach over here is a, is a, is a giant peach called July Sun, and it is huge, and it is an excellent quality peach. This is PF24. This is probably 750 grams, and which is close to the world record of uh, the largest peach. This is a flat peach. There are different varieties of flat peach that we are testing and this particular variety is called Jupiter and it is a white flesh, very tasty. This one is Sweet Dream. If somebody is interested in yellow flesh peach, uh, kind of late season, uh, actually I would say that for early September season, this would be the choice, Sweet Dream, and it does extremely well under our conditions. So, Doctor, how important is the tree to the health and the production of good fruit? It is extremely important because imagine that the leaves on the trees, they are like a laboratory. It's manufacturing all of those goodies, all of the food that the, the uh, fruit takes from them. So for better fruit, scientists test better ways of taking care of the trees. We want to make sure the tree is pruned and trained in such a form that can harvest the sun, if you will. Harvest the sun, it means it can take the energy of the sun without being blocked by the canopy. Therefore, we need to expose them to the, to the sun. As an average, a fruit like this, it is probably the best quality you can imagine, needs to have 70% of light penetration inside of the tree canopy in order to produce good fruit for this year and also strong buds for next year. Just as, as a general rule, if you, if you stay on, in, in the shade of your trees in the backyard, end of June or early July, if you see some light is penetrating through the canopy, you see some light on the floor right on the drip line of the tree, you know that the pruning was done right. But if you are staying in a shade, it is completely shade, almost dark, that is too crowded. Okay, let's go look at some of the different varieties you have here. So what are these? Uh, this is Queens. Uh, Queens is one of the many uh, alternative fruits that we are testing in this orchard. Uh, Queens is native to Iran and it is used for jelly and jam. So what is this? Uh, this is a new plum that uh, basically the gene bag bank of that is from Iran and it is fantastic. It is, oh wow, uh, what a different like? taste. It is Yum. different taste and uh, we are trying that here and our growers mm. are extremely excited about that. The team shows off this year's crop at the station's annual fruit day celebration. It's a chance for growers to see and taste new varieties and to find out the latest science has to offer. Science is very important in, in uh, fruit production and growing trees. Why? We need through science to know what would be, what it makes a tree more efficient in terms of production. 
For example, if if a large trees in a large trees you may need 40 leaves for one fruit, but in a more efficient tree, a more dwarf trees, you may need only 20 leaves per fruit. And the best part of growing a more efficient tree is that you get to eat your research. This is a wonderful tasting pitch. Hi, my name is Kylie and I go to Dalton Elementary in Dalton Gardens. My question is, how can you tell how old a tree is by the rings? Well, most trees every year they have a growing season and when they're doing their photosynthesis and making food for themselves, they're growing different parts of their body. So they're growing up and getting taller, their branches are growing out and getting longer and they're adding a little bit of wood to their trunk. And so you can see on a tree when they make their annual ring is what it's called, they'll do that once a year generally speaking. And so you can find out how old a tree is by looking at each year it makes another ring of wood and it, that's the way that you could tell a tree's age. You can also tell more about them. So we have these two that are from trees that were about the same size. The trunks were about the same size, but if you look at, close at this one, this one is only about 13 years old. This one I couldn't even count. I would need a magnifying lens to see the rings on this one. So these grew in very different conditions. Maybe this one had lots of space and didn't have much competition. Maybe this one had more. Maybe this one grew in a nice spot with a long growing season. Maybe this one grew in a spot with a short growing season. You're not quite sure of the answer unless you know exactly where they grew and who was taking care of them. But you can learn a lot from looking at their annual rings, including their age and many other things. Um, I'd like to go ahead and, and expand on that a little bit uh, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the rings of the tree. Uh, you might ask yourself why uh, rings are there, why they're dark and then light. Uh, it actually has to do with the time of year that the, that the tree grows. In the spring, when there's a lot of water and the sun's just coming out and things are warming up, the tree puts on a lot of growth. That's where you end up with the light wood where it's, where it's very thick. Um, as the spring wears on into summer, it gets hotter, perhaps drier, there's a little more stress on the tree. Those, uh, the growth starts to slow down and you get, end up with a smaller, darker ring uh, of growth um, as fall is coming into winter. Amy would like to know, why is sap found in trees? Sap is found in trees because it's really how they get their water and nutrients to help themselves grow. So um, in photosynthesis, they take water and nutrients from the soil and they take sunlight as the energy and they take in carbon dioxide through their leaves and needles. And through that process, they make all the food that they need to grow and make all of the parts that they have. So the sap is actually what is going up in the tubes called xylem. So the roots have xylem in them and the roots are sucking up the water and nutrients and they're taking it up the tree and sending it out the branches and into the leaves. And even if you look at the veins in a leaf, that's xylem too. You're seeing xylem and phloem in there. So xylem is where the sap is being carried out to the tree and it's the water and nutrients so that it can um, do all of the things it needs to do in order to grow. Gabby asks, how do trees make maple syrup? Uh, maple syrup comes from maple trees and it might interest you Gabby to know that um, you can make maple syrup from a lot of different kind of maple trees. It just so happens that you can get the best syrup uh, with the least amount of effort from sugar maples, not surprisingly given the name. Um, trees are tapped in the fall and the sap comes out of the tree and it takes a lot of sap to make just a small pint of maple syrup. That sap, uh, gallons of it, are collected and then boiled down, concentrated, the sugars are concentrated, and that's when it becomes maple syrup. And actually I don't believe you can call maple syrup maple syrup unless it's 100 percent maple syrup. Otherwise you get things like uh, just plain pancake syrup uh, that is not um, made from maple trees. Brian, before we run out of time, let me ask you a question. Why did you decide to make studying trees your job? 
Uh, I actually started as a computer programmer when I first got out of high school and went to college and um, worked for several years uh, as a computer programmer. Didn't take me long to decide that I didn't, that really wasn't the life for me. Too much indoors work, too much sitting behind a computer and, and trying to fix somebody else's mess ups. Um, so I went back to school uh, in my mid 20s. Uh, I was about 25 years old when I decided to go back to college at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I still didn't know what I wanted to do, but I kind of got into the environmental sciences and met a few people there about uh, learning about what they were doing, and some of them were um, arborists, urban foresters. This is something I'd never heard of before, and it sounded interesting. So I uh, kept asking questions, and it's like, you know, that's pretty neat. That in cooperation with, I had a great professor in college for my botany. Botany is just the study of plant life. And he just lit a fire under me. He loved botany. He loved the study of plants and how they grow and physiology and all that stuff so much. It just kind of infected me. So I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And uh, I've always loved trees uh, ever since I was a little kid. I mean, what little kid doesn't love trees? So. Uh, I decided to make it my life, and now I am responsible for, you know, between 40 and 50,000 trees here in the city of Boise, the city of trees, and I couldn't be happier with my job right now. And Michelle, if someone is interested in doing this for a living, what should they study in school? Well, there are lots of good things that you can study, and, and just like Brian, I didn't come to this job by knowing that's what I wanted to do, so I started out as a high school biology teacher, so my background in in biology and education was really helpful in in what I'm doing now and there are so many forest related jobs whether you're working in a sawmill or out in the woods or helping to make maps or you're the graphic designer for a company there's so many different things so I think one of the best things that people can do is really have a good background in science math um, technology is always important nowadays and so all of those, um, they're called STEM careers now, science, technology, engineering, and math. If you can get a good background in that, you will be so versatile and you'll be able to do a wide variety of jobs from being a hydrologist to being a forest engineer or helping design bridges and roads, all kinds of different things. Or like me, helping people learn more about trees and forests in their backyard. I'm sorry we've run out of time. Thank you, Brian Michelle, for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Joan. Appreciate it, too. It was fun to be here. And my thanks also to the folks here at the Laura Moore Cunningham Memorial Arboretum for hosting us. You can learn lots more about trees and other scientific topics on the Science Trek website. We'll answer more science questions about trees on Science Trek, the web show. And if you want to submit a question for Science Trek, it's easy. And you and your class can win prizes. You can send it as an email or a video question. Record it on your webcam or cell phone. And if you're an educator, we'll even lend you a camera. Our last prize winner was Will at Mrs. Schweitzer's class at Riverside Elementary in Boise. So to find out all about trees and how to send in your questions and how to win, go to the Science Trek website. And each week, check out my blog for the latest science news. You'll find it all at idahoptv.org slash science trek. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time here on Science Trek. Presentation of Science Trek on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. If you want to learn more about this topic or watch our videos, check out the Science Trek website at idahoptv.org slash science trek.